Hello, Julie. How are ah, you? I'm doing fairly well, thank you. How about yourself? Very well. On a nice rainy New England day. Yeah. So we're going to continue on in our dialogue with one another. And first of all, I want to thank you for two things. One is for being available for doing this with me. And I think it's very useful for our relationship and our process um, in, in human and, and spiritual and transcendental terms in relationship to the divine process and Adi Da. And then also to thank you so much for all of what you do on B Zone. Uh, I'm really grateful for all of the um, long time work that you've been doing. And whenever you send me something new, it always seems to be synchronous um, and correspond to something very pertinent to the process itself. Mm -hmm. And um, and I would imagine because I know you're not thinking about me, you know, when you're doing these posts, but that uh, because it feels synchronous with me, um, I imagine that there would be something somewhat similar with others, but perhaps they're receiving or viewing or participating in what you're putting out there in a way that relates to their own divine process and, and their own practice. So I, I, I appreciate that. Mm. Well, what, what you what you're sharing with me and I, and I, I I'm not, uh, you know, ignorant of these kinds of connections that you're referring to. And especially when we're as connected as we are in, in other areas of life and, and what we've been doing together. What you're telling me is not uncommon, but people who I am in relationship with Adida in the same manner that we are. And in the past, that is a very, very, um, I won't say just say common, but I would say extraordinary um, confession that the link up in the M field, if you will, or the, the field that we are connected in uh, is synchronistic. So I, I'm not planning on sending things to you. I come mm. upon them as they mm. appear to me and I mm. feel you in your enjoyment or understanding of those mm. items. And you're one of the few. And sometimes mm. you're the only one that I think can hear or see or appreciate what it is that I'm sending. And so it's not, uh, it doesn't go unnoticed what you're telling mm. me. Mm. Mm. Yes. And of course, this would be synchronous with my understanding of the process with Arida in the sense that it's an eternal conversation. And when he refers to that, he is referring to the context or the source condition in which our relationship is arising. And the direct relationship with him then is active in that regard. And this also occurs with other devotees in my relationship with them. And right. the most interesting part of it is that it's all linked. Like it may be a different aspect of their life or our life or a different aspect of the teaching, but the process itself is synchronous. It's it's I, I feel it's what Adi Da describes as the super physics of the relationship. And and, and, um, and, 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 and there the traditions is the synchronicity of Carl Jung. It's the synchronicity of 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 other people. Well, whether it be Sheldrake or other people, it's just mm -hmm. an active field. And when you become aware of that, um, yeah. And some people just call it psychic or whatever. Uh, I like the M field of Sheldrake's definition of it to see sure, it's, beyond, sure. it's beyond time and space. Yeah, yes, yes. So we're speaking about a truth. Right, right. Yeah. I was just thinking yeah. of the well, the quality, but I hear you. I hear you. Yes, yes. I, I mean, I meaning it meaning a truth that is pointed to or directly experienced or come to be known or understood throughout the divine process that encompasses all the great traditions, um, whether they are, you know, uh, about 
shamans or yogis or saints or sages. Um, and, and the manner in which that realization or understanding has come to be known through the traditions. Right. Um, and then Adi Da's unique revelation of it in relationship to it. So I, what, what I wanted to talk with you about is, um, a, this is a good segue actually to what I wanted to ask you about, to hear you speak about your life and your process um, in relationship to this matter. So there's a, um, I'm going to be referring to notes. That's why I'm looking down. Okay. Um, so based on uh, a writing that you um, penned or paraphrased in relationship to, I think it's probably your own process, but then also Adida's words. I will read that. It's because it's brief. I'll read that right now and then and ask then ask you the question about it. All right. So you indicate that um, in, in this writing, because I had asked you if this was your own writing, and then you replied somewhat, but it was, a, um, it, it was based upon your study of the spiritual stages of life, entering into a spiritualized stage of practice, and then you input in parentheses, which I thought was great, unmediated without substances. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big one. That's a big one. <laughs> And then I'll read it. Once the individual passes through the crisis of ego death and the knot in the navel is severed, the heart breaks open. Then the beginning of the fourth stage of life begins. Energy is felt to be centered in the region of the middle chest. The life energy is no longer associated with the left side of the heart and the downward current. The current of life is reversed. The revulsion of life energy needing to be thrown out has turned. Breathing comes in and out of the heart region and the navel is expanded. Breathing falls naturally into the navel. The belly has dropped. The navel is expanded with life energy. The contraction or not in the navel is gone. One is aware and awake from the heart. The feeling center of being is the middle heart. Feeling is awakened and the mummery of life is awakened. The play of life is just that, a play. Life is no longer a serious affair. Humor is awakened and laughter is alive. Every moment is a moment of unfolding possibilities without the crunch of death pressing in. This stage of life is the beginning of the subtle astral or higher mind. The mind continues as it did before, only in the context of the open heart. Feeling is awakened and is not the origin of one's life. The horror of this is the madness of life of what others are doing. The unity of what one feels at this stage is alive and the need for strife, struggle and the fight for survival is ended. One is alive and is lived. The breathing is happening and the mind is running. The witness is alive. In some cases, the mind is blank. Nothing is happening anymore. The content of images and visions is gone. One closes one's eyes and there is nothing there. It's a blank, black screen. Breathing is alive and feeling is pulsating. Thoughts continue and are witnessed. Freedom is apparent. Your home and the paradox is awakened, not just philosophically, but actually in every moment. Human demands of life are exactly the same. The only difference is one's relationship to them. The mystery is awakened and the responsibility to submit to that which is, is constant and alive. This is the beginning of spiritual life. So that's a lot. That that encompasses a lot. Right. So I, I asked you, um, and I sent this to you in a question form. So this is brief and I'll read it to you. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. 
so based on what you wrote there, did you feel that what Adi Da describes in Bright Sot Song as ego death was occurring when you had the experience of the knot in the navel, not being the place from which you lived. That's something that we discussed earlier about your own life, which was a very significant transition for you. But you indicated that you lived from the heart position. Right. That's where you, you are located. So at that, was that your standing, understanding at that time relative oh, to? Oh, no, no. That, the, the experience happened. It is only after many, 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 many uh, years of investigating trying to understand what had occurred. Okay. And then, of course, Adida's illuminating wisdom on this specific issue of the vital shock as he as he spoke to me when he in in the method of the Siddhas. Mm -hmm. And and of all of my study up to that point. Right. I was trying to, you know, I could understand the the loss of ego with Alan Watts in in the book, in the taboo of knowing who you are, because that's one of the first pieces of literature that came across my uh, desk, if you will, that that spoke to this phenomenon that occurred for me. But mm. believe now, I have to say, I had no, no background, zero background on any of the spiritual literature, religious literature, or even philosophical literature. I was completely ignorant in any understanding of what had occurred. Okay. But it was, but, so I had no sense of things. And the only thing I I felt was if this phenomenon had freed me from my previous understanding of who I was, mm -hmm. why were things continuing to arise as they were previously? It, as, as if nothing had changed. But in another sense, everything had changed. The whole my whole relationship to not only my body and my feeling, but the world, it became a, a kind of, as, as he points out, the mummery, the play, the game, the, 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 the unseriousness of, of, of life in mm -hmm. a threatening manner. Now, you, the responsibility is still held. And, and, and that was just beginning for me because I had not engaged life in any way. I think I was a, a, a sophomore in college at that time, 1970 or 71. Right. So right. I had zero understanding. And mm. so only from that, that moment that I started to say, well, I better start looking for something of understanding of that. And the first one that really spoke to me was Watts's book, um, uh, the book, Does It Matter? which of course then got me into Alan Watts, then also got me into eventually a lot of different authors and writers, but Buddhism and, and D2 Suzuki and the Lankarva Sutra and, and, and all of that other stuff. So that was the initial impetus for me to understand what was happening. Right, right. And trying to get a sense of what was. And so mm. when I came across the method of the Siddhas, and he spoke of vital shock because that was the, the primary difference in bodily terms that I was no longer, I didn't feel the, my stomach had ballooned. And so I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't understand yeah. that. But when he, when he spoke to that, that was my real interest in going further into Arita and his teaching on vital shock, the self-contraction, and the whole thing. So I was trying to conform it to uh, the three poisons in Buddhism, 
you know, uh, the, I was trying to conform my his teaching to what I was understanding on the wheel of life and the 12 chains of causation and the three poisons and, and all of that stuff. And it really was kind of working, but I, Adida has spoke, spoke so clearly of this and it was really the foundation my my doorway into his work and it and it, 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 I followed that because I thought that was a primary and crucial understanding yeah. but then I whenever I looked through his literature that was the the main shaft that okay. I was going for is sure. the final shock mm. and, and, and I and I that was my I wanted to understand everything. And over the years, and now it's been, I don't know, 30, 40 years, I have kind of summarized through his teaching, through my understanding, the Don Horse Testament. And I have come up with, a, with, a, with and I've posted it on the B zone. And I, and, I, and, I, and I can verify it within the Don Horse Testament. I can verify it with his word. I can point to his teachings that definitely says, the release of the vital shock is the entrance into the fourth stage of life. And um, mm. I've done so much work on that. So mm. that that was my doorway to understand. Not that I'm saying I'm in the fourth stage of life, and I don't want to put anything on that. I'm just saying my understanding of that is this mm. is what I've come up with my yeah. understanding to um to, to explain what happened for for me, but I still, yeah. um, you know, I, I I don't even understand. I don't even try. I mean, I do a lot of meditation. I do a lot of study. I do a lot of stuff. It, the whole the whole point is is that you're not trying to figure things out anymore as much as you're following a current. You're following signs and and energies, and and, and it's no longer got to deal with. I drank ayahuasca for, I don't know, four or five years, hundreds of times yeah. with South American shamans. Yeah. And and I could go through the third, the, this uh, this open, and I would go, I would travel. Um, mm. But it still wasn't it, you know? I could still find myself in realms upon realms of people with interest of, of travel, shamans and, and teachings and, and things of that sort. It wasn't like, okay, I'm now, whatever, able to do these kinds of astral travels or subtle travel. Because fundamentally, you saw that it was always no, there was no place to go. You were always in that present state. No matter what arose, where you went, what you did, it was the same over and over again. You were in a position to be responsible or whatever was appearing in the in the in the mind or the body or in life, it was just mm. self-evident. There was no place to go. Mm. And well, whatever that occurred, me of, yeah, sorry. well, that reminds. Oh, that just reminds me of when you often will say the light is always on. Right, and 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 you even even when you're sleeping or or there's no there's no like. There's no, there's no way. There's no way. It's just yeah. whatever is arising. Some of it's good. Some of it's bad. Some of it's difficult. Some of it's, and that's where the purification is always understood. That you just have to endure, not suffer. But this, this you get a sense that there's this purifying process that you're involved with now, way beyond your understanding, way beyond what you could even get a glimpse of, because now you know you're in a, you're. <laughs> You're in a, you're you're way beyond your depth, or yes. in 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 the sense yes. of yes. knowledge. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So, so yeah. mm, beautiful. Um, there's a couple things that immediately uh, come to attention in, in terms of wanting to ask you about, and that is that I'm, re I'm remembering obviously the numerous times I have heard Beloved directly speak about um, this matter of the manner in which the process works. And in him speaking about his own life and the sod in the years and his own demonstration of the seventh way, 
is he would often say that he did not understand fully what occurred spontaneously and priorly in relationship to the bride being born in the bride and as the bride, that he would not fully comprehend or be able to initially cognize what happened. And um, so I'm hearing you describe a similar thing. Um, so anything to say about that in particular, about your understanding of Beloved's revelation in that regard too? Well, it, 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 well, one is that he is so instructive for me in, in trying to Well, because for me, I had to learn life, really. I mean, I was not even in, in life at all. Um, um, well, it confirms. Mm -hmm. It confirms my, my, my feeling. It's not mm -hmm. that I'm copying his. No, you know, no, mm, no. Yeah, and that's not what I'm pointing to at all. I, we maybe couldn't. <laughs> As we know, <laughs> his function is entirely unique in in relationship to our process, and right. and you know, but he does say, "Look, study my life." That is the primary principle form. Study my confession. Study my life. The process itself will be exactly the same in right. terms of how it is revealed. So, you know, when I feel that confession is what is being described, is the source condition that is the bride is always already the case. The right. divine process itself is always already the case. Even as the, 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 the unmediated, the divine itself, that is the same source condition as everyone and everything is as it is in every divine process, no matter how it manifests for each individual, although experientially it will be different according to, as we've spoken about so many times and as Beloved points to, relative to the seventh stage schema, it's different depending upon the psychobiography of the ego. Mm -hmm. And and then also what this reveals is that um, it's not a seeking process because you're not cognizing it in advance such that you're making it happen by virtue of an effort or a method or a program or participation in some kind of a structural experience or even mapping of the manner in which life may arise and appear as it is cosmically or even universally that is the same as the microcosm and the macrocosm and all the different ways that we could speak about the permutations but that um you're talking about you as, as Adida said in his awakening in the Vedanta temple, he began to live and breathe and notice that he was synchronous, that, that being itself, non-dual, the he and the she, the Atmanadi Shakti, is, was, is the condition from which he then lived. And noticing that his function began to become clear in the midst of that. Of course, we're not taking on the guru function, but we're noticing the process of the guru function being active in our life, even before we were aware <laughs> of being able to name it right. or to be able right. to identify the, the um, threshold personality. And, and there are many threshold personalities according to the stages of realization or the samadhis, the divine samadhis that, that point to the source condition. So that that's what I was referring to. Right. Um, right. Yeah. 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 Mm. Mm. yeah. Again, the superphysics of the transcendental spiritual oneness of everyone and everything. Mm. Therein, you are lived and breathed. And so, and I, and I, when I hear you describe this process, this is what is significant. And this is what Adi Da would say in the process of reality consideration with one another and what he did with us and what he taught us. And, and I directly am absolutely certain of this and have been perpetually established in this by the grace 
the, by divine grace that this is how we are to consider the process with one another so that we can locate the source and then through the synchronicities and the spontaneous synchronicities that occur through our study, through our practice, through the meditation, through, you know, taking care of ourselves and in terms of what's required to establish equanimity, you know, the freeing of energy and attention through, through the release of um, the bondage that is attention when it's tied to the ego act itself. So in, in your process, in, in this instance, again, can you speak about your understanding of ego death then? Because um, in that quote that I read that you had posted on B-Zone, that, you know, and remembering what you spoke about in terms of the release from the navel, the, the severing of the, the vital shock, that after that time, um, um, as you was, have indicated previously, you weren't scot-free. <laughs> I mean, there was still a process of adaptation and responsibility, right? Big time. Big time. And not in real, like, uh, in, uh, um, you know, it still required everything that anybody else would have had to done in the first three stages of life. Relationship, money, job, sex, everything, everything had to be adapted to. Everything had to be incorporated. I, I hadn't even developed in any way in those forms. So I had to adapt to to life. I had to that first to education and then relationship and then money and those those elements those are just straight up things you had to do in a way that was harmonious and balanced as much as they could be received by others and what you could deal with in your own um manner uh, one thing that that I noticed is that sometimes I was a little bit foolish in my, if you will, fearlessness because fear was not operating as much in my okay. in my in my <laughs> in my way. And yeah, I would sure. put myself, I would put myself in some what turned out to be dangerous physically and mentally. Because remember, I said I worked in mental institutions. Um, I put myself in situations and I always tended to do that because I saw how people could control other people through fear. I saw how fear operated. I began to see how fear operated in the world and I saw how it limited people and how other mm. people were controlling it and how people mm. were using it for excitement or bungee jumping or whatever, um, mm. you know, high speed motor, you know, just thrill seekers. I saw how, how I saw how fear was being used, but I also saw how fear was in the eyes and the hearts of most people. This is the fight, and then no, 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 and then the cautiousness and the protection, and and no, you don't do that, and you might offend him, you know, and and that put me into a lot of difficulty because I I didn't have those same same kinds of boundaries, so I had to develop boundaries socially and being in places where you want to laugh your ass off about what's going on and the seriousness of things because right. there's there's a lot of humor that goes with a little bit of freedom here mm. like mm. what what what, what do you what, what, what's what the problem here right you know? yeah yeah you know and yeah. Then you had to put then you had to play because you know the first thing i started to realize is that and the only thing I spoke to and I found myself getting in trouble was the illusion of ego. That's what I, that's, I guess if there was anything that I kind of got was that there was no ego. Right. In, and I in started terms of, to... In ter sorry, in terms of a, um, at that, at the point when you began to understand this, had you come across Adi Da's teaching in terms of the his unique description of the ego? Not at that time. In the beginning, okay. it was only in the Buddhist sense. Okay. No yeah. ego. 
the three marks of being. And one of the yeah. marks, primary marks is no ego. So even in some of the teacher trainings that I was with, or Chaoyo Trumpa, or uh, these other people, you know, that was that was that was said to be the the fundamental understanding. There is no ego. Well, you can mm -hmm. say that until the cows come home, but to live that and to be in situations where it would have to show itself in life that you weren't so. I wouldn't say. Um, you know, stupid about things, mm. but you surely were not constrained by the limitations of fear that other people were being constrained by. Not that I was trying to be a race car driver or anything like that. I'm just saying in simple situations. Mm. Um, mm. And uh, so I took that on as an understanding in the beginning before I came into Adidas understanding and teaching. So I took no ego and I started to speak in those terms in the Buddhist settings that I was involved mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw that people could understand it to a point, but when it got to, I, I, I kind of caught, I got caught in that understanding. I got caught in no ego. And I saw how that in itself was a trap that anything that I started to understand as and hold on to or get some conceptual understanding um, and uh, start speaking about some kind of truth out there. Um, it just, I, I saw that that was not going to work and it wasn't, I was, I was beginning to be an owner of this no ego kind of stuff. So I said, you know, all, all of this brings a sus, you can, you set, you have yourself as a suspect because you realize that you can't, you have no ground to, to grasp on. You have no knowledge becomes a, a, a problem in itself that you start to mm. be a knower. Mm. And you, you get to see that if you start to, to claim or, or, or say anything, because the paradox is there is there is a little sense that you could be, oh goodness, I I better watch myself here. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Because so there's still time... there's still those other parts of the psyche that are are not not right. not purified. So the right. subtle subtle ego and the causally all that stuff, which I had no understanding of. Right. was was still operating at a level that I was not aware of because I was still physically based and just becoming aware emotionally and on the lower mental and the higher middle centers of the brain. I didn't understand mm. the, the subtle stuff because I can see how then the subtle mind can create an identity of freedom here. So sure. it really gets complicated. So, you know, after a while... Yeah you know, I just shut my mouth and, and just started to practice.